Ray Comfort is a creationist who's, who's got some crazy ideas. This, this is, these are some words. These, these are Ray Comfort's very own words. This is stuff he's published in a book. This is stuff he really believes. And I, I just want you to take a moment. I will be silent and read this. <laughs> this is amazing stuff, isn't it? This is Darwin's theory. Men and women living side by side for millions of years, breeding true, never, never having sex. Again, I teach college. I know this is impossible. So there, there they are. They're reproducing after their own kind. And, and furthermore, he's saying that Darwin claimed that in a primitive state, we reproduced asexually by splitting down the middle. And this is his refutation of evolution. You know, if, if, if I had to, well, just imagine this, okay? Uh, imagine that Ray Comfort reproduced. I know there's, there's both horror in your mind, and we're also speculating a lot about how a Ray Comfort would reproduce. But imagine that it happened, and Ray Jr. showed up in my class, and I had to mention something about sex. I teach genetics. I have to, okay? <laughs> What would happen when little Ray's mind melted down right there on the desk in my classroom? Would I be arrested and charged with unconstitutional acts or something? Uh, this, is, this is something just absolutely absurd. We cannot, we cannot constrain science and say, you're only allowed to teach things that don't contradict people's most devout beliefs. It's not going to work. There's absolutely nothing that a science teacher can teach if she is constrained by a need to respect mere religious belief. Now, this is Ray Comfort. And you can say, okay, we don't have to worry about the Ray Comforts because they ought to be institutionalized and they shouldn't be going to school anyway. This is a, this is a, this is a man in serious need of psychological help. So maybe he doesn't count. But it's not just the people who deny evolution that bug me. Uh, there's also scientists who muddle science and religion. And they make a terrible botch of it. So Ken Miller, for instance. Ken Miller is, is an American biologist. He's a cell biologist. And I will freely admit, he's a smart guy. He's a really good speaker, too. He's written a, a, an important science textbook for the public schools. Uh, he's fought against creationism. He's, he's not exactly the enemy, except he has to always try and squeeze God in somewhere in these various explanations. And, and that's not something a science, scientist should do. And I'll give you one example of this. This is from an interview that he did uh, a few months ago uh, where the reporter confronted him with this notion that Catholics have of divine intervention, that you can pray for relief, uh, that in particular you can go to places like Lourdes and there's supposed to be magic water there or something, and people throw away their crutches, and they dance, and they, they feel all better until they get home, and then they collapse and die. But <laughs> there is this Catholic idea that you can have God stepping in to do good for you just by the power of prayer, which is, which is very nice. But there's something you should notice about lords is, is they never grow back amputated limbs. There seems to be a limit to what God will do. If you're feeling icky, you've got a cold or you've got cancer, you might get temporary relief and say you're in remission. But no, if you've lost an eyeball or you've lost a limb, that never seems to get fixed. And uh, Miller has his answer for this. He says that, that God has to work in sneaky ways. <laughs> that if God were to regrow grow limbs for amputees, for instance, if God were to perform the sort of miracles demanded by us nasty, rude atheists as proof of his, of his existence, the consequences would be disastrous. And you're wondering, what kind of disastrous consequences would happen if you grew back a, a lost limb? Um, well, he says, you know, if, if this were common knowledge, that if you prayed dip, deeply that the limb would grow back, that would reduce God to a kind of supranatural force. <laughs> And, you know, I, again, I would love to have Ken Miller here so I could quiz him on this. Uh, what is God but a supernatural force? 
is there, is, is, is he like a garbage man or something that's got a material form and does an actual physical task? Or is he a supernatural being? Well, anyway, so it would make him a supernatural force. And by pushing the button labeled prayer, you would accomplish anything you, would, you wanted. What would that do to moral independence? We don't want to compromise moral independence, after all. And, you know, you have some catastrophic accident, you have a spinal injury, you've lost your limb. Well, getting fixed, that might just, I don't know what. You'd be, you'd be, I, I don't even know what moral independence means. Um, well, what we've got to do, though, is, is I've got to talk to, I've got to talk to Ken Miller sometime. I want to show him this, this one slide here. Uh, this is a salamander, and you, it's really easy to do these experiments. I know it sounds cruel. We anesthetize them when we do this, okay? Uh, you can take a pair of scissors and snip off a limb, and what happens? It grows back. There, it's proved. It's, it's, it's photographically shown that you take these things, and, and after a month and a half or so, uh, the limb grows back just fine. It's, it's indistinguishable from the original limb. It's functional. They walk. They can feel with it. They can do everything they did with the limb before this, which obviously means that God likes salamanders better than us. <laughs> or salamanders have compromised moral independence. <laughs> They're sneaky, slimy little bastards. You can't trust them, apparently. So, you know, this is a scientist making this totally bizarre ad hoc argument to justify the fact that his god is a lazy no good who doesn't do anything for people. Why should we muddle up science with that kind of rationalization? We can look at salamanders and study them. And there are a lot of people who study salamander regeneration because, because we would like to be able to do that. Figuring out what kinds of rules are going on in the developmental system behind the, the salamander limb and puzzling out what kinds of molecules are interacting, what is, what is the role of scar tissue, how do nerves grow back to the appropriate connections, et cetera. This is an active research program right now. And I, I hope Ken Miller wouldn't tell us that we are now flouting God's will or that if doctors accomplish, if they figure out how to, do, how to do spinal cord repair, if they figure out how to regrow limbs, that suddenly we've faced with this horrible fate of, of diminished moral independence. If I were an amputee, yeah, I would trade moral independence for a regrown limb any time. So we've got this, this problem of confrontation where we've got some people who are making excuses for religion, and they're using this as, as a rationale to tell all the atheists to shut up. They are telling people like me and telling people like Richard Dawkins that we're harming the cause of science education. And I was glad to see that Gregory Paul this, earlier this morning, or earlier this afternoon, uh, said that that's not the case, because we don't think it's the case either, uh, that, that we are somehow harming the cause of science education by insisting that we divorce it from religion and God, and furthermore, pointing out that God explanations don't do any good. They're absolutely useless. What I would say instead is, is that we are not atheist enough. That what we have as an obligation as science educators is to make it clear that when you are in the science classroom, you are in a no-God zone. Now, this doesn't mean that, that we have to proselytize for atheism. We don't have to tell all our students, no, you cannot get an A in my class unless you reject the Pope. That's not going to happen. It will never happen in my classroom. I, I know for a fact that many religious students are quite competent and quite intelligent and do very well in my classes. And similarly, I know that there are many scientists who are very smart and intelligent and do quite well at the enterprise of science. But in every case when they're doing this work, they are divorcing themselves from this religious impulse. They have to. Uh, so what we need to do is, is, is emphasize this. What I would think would be ideal is for all science teachers to be able to come into the classroom and say, I'm an atheist for this next hour. Maybe when I go home, I'll pray tonight and I'll go to church on Sunday. But in the classroom, we're atheists, every one of us. And if you're, if you're not willing to accept that constraint, and I think it's a very limited constraint, uh, then you don't belong in the science classroom. Now, uh, this is not about 
laying out specific beliefs that a student must have. It's about a mindset. It's about a way to think. It's about teaching them how to use a toolkit, uh, a toolkit that uses reason and evidence and critical thinking so that they can learn to think for themselves. That uh, this is what we want, that we want to make it clear that teaching the evidence is not the same as imposing religious dogma. Michael Ruse is full of shit, okay? That when we get into the classroom and we start saying, yeah, the, the world is four and a half billion years old and, and human beings are, have uh, been around for 200,000 years and we make that little creationist kid who thinks the world is only 6,000 years old squirm, uh, we are not preaching a religion. We're teaching the evidence. We're teaching the facts. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to give Michael Ruse's conniptions and that will frighten the timid high school administrators, but science is godless and we need to embrace that fact. And it's not our fault that reality has a godless bias. It's the way it seems to be. Now, just think about what we know about the universe, for instance. This is a violation of many religions core fundamental principles. Not all, I will admit it. But if you think about the universe, uh, this, is, this is our universe. It's huge and complicated. Uh, what you're seeing right here is, is a photo that was taken by the Herschel Deep Field Telescope. Uh, and what they did is they aimed this scope at a little tiny patch of sky, seven arc minutes on a side. Just a tiny little square of, of, of sky that if you looked at it, you know, even if you pulled up binoculars and stared at it, you would say, oh, that's completely empty space. It's all black can't see a thing. But then you let this telescope expose that image for about 70 hours, just collect all these faint, feeble uh, rays of light that are coming in from so far away, and you accumulate an image. What you discover is this, that that tiny little square of empty spaces you look at there is full of stars. And those aren't all just stars. It's full of galaxies. This is what I mean by huge, gigantic. If there were a bacterium in this room, I know there is. I'm guarantee it. There's a bacterium floating somewhere around here or sitting on you or in your gut or something. Uh, this, this is like saying that this, this little bacterium fills a greater proportion of the space in this room than the Earth does in the entire galaxy and in, even worse in the entire universe. And what we're essentially suggesting when we say that the, that the universe was made for us is, is, is it's like this bacterium announcing to itself, oh, well, this lovely building was built just for me. So this is, this is one of the implications of the, uh, of the facts, the evidence, that religious people don't like. That we are a tiny speck in a gigantic universe. And it doesn't seem to, to us, looking at it objectively, that any special attention has been paid, attention, paid to us by a loving God. Uh, furthermore, you know, when you look at time, it's not just big in space, it's, it's big in time. 13.7 billion years is how old the universe is. That the human race has only existed for about 200,000 years. A tiny fraction of that immense amount of space. That our planet is built of the leftover debris from multiple generations of stars forming and falling apart. It's really, really old. And we're going to pretend that all of this, all this space, all this time is dedicated to one little group of apes on one little planet in the middle of this immensity, and that the most important thing about these apes is the status of their genitals, according to this god. <laughs> it's, it's just ludicrous in the extreme. Now again, these are very annoying facts to religious believers. No, again, not all religious believers. There are many religions that have, can accommodate this, but many others that cannot. If one thing is, is common to many religions, it's the importance of the human race, the, ex, the human exceptionalism. 